Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Keating Chambers and Quad webinar on planning for the infrastructure revolution. My name is Charlie Banner. I'm a barrister at Keating Chambers specialising in planning infrastructure and related fields. Um, we've heard a great deal in recent weeks about streamlining what I personally call the conventional planning regime, namely plan making and development control under the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 and the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. Uh, the Planning for the Future white paper, about which you've probably heard little else, in the last few uh, weeks contains far-reaching proposals for rewriting that conventional regime so as to reduce the delay, procedural red tape and unpredictability that in the eyes of many has become a hallmark of the planning process. But what about the infrastructure planning regime? The white paper was understandably almost silent on that as its focus was on elsewhere. Um, but we know, however, that the so-called infrastructure revolution is at the heart of the government's economic agenda with project speed being a key plank of the drive to level up the country. And that was the case even before COVID, and if anything, it must be all the more important now. So is the infrastructure planning regime under the Planning Act 2008 in perfect shape for this purpose? Or can it too be made more efficient so as to streamline the process for determining DCO applications for nationally significant infrastructure projects? What about other means of consenting infrastructure too? Well, these are some of the questions we hope to be addressing today. Um, we're extremely fortunate to be joined by Bridget Rosewell, CVE, who's going to start us off with some of the blue sky thinking for which she's rightly famous, and with her invaluable perspective as a member of the task force appointed to draw up the proposals in the white paper. I'll then follow up with some ideas from a legal and procedural perspective as to how the 2008 Act regime could be sharpened up. And then uh, Matthew Sharp, a director at Quad, and a board member of the National Infrastructure Planning Association, will outline how housing proposals could be brought within the NSIP regime as mooted by the white paper. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so please do submit any questions or comments you may have in the Q&A box at the uh, bottom of your Zoom screens. Um, and with all that housekeeping, I'll pass straight over to Bridget um, to open up the discussion. Bridget, over to you. Thanks very much, Charlie, and it's great to be here, and uh, virtually as ever, of course. Um, I'm a Friday afternoon, so um, uh, let's uh, see if we can come up with something really different on a Friday afternoon for the revolution in infrastructure. I'm not sure whether revolution, the trouble with the revolution is it can actually stop things happening. When I was sitting on the planning task force, we were really trying to think about things which would be evolutions, so that after all, if what you're trying to do is speed things up, Revolutions tend to be very violent and dangerous and everybody gets very upset and everything stops while you sort out your revolution. So continuity is actually one of the elements that we need to find in our kind of navigation through these complex systems. And, and I suppose the other thing about the planning task force is that one of the drivers was really about how do we make sure we can get more houses? Yeah, that was the kind of in government's mind. There was a lot of stuff around houses, although the members were thinking much more broadly than that. So perhaps the first thing to start with, if we're going to have an infrastructure revolution, well, what is infrastructure? What is it that we are going to be talking about here? And my other role is as a commissioner with the National Infrastructure Commission. So I've got a definition mm -hmm. because we've got a remit and it does not include housing, incidentally because obviously housing was far too sensitive to be allowed to sit on the, uh, uh, on the remit of the Infrastructure Commission, although many people thought it should be. So it's uh, water, waste, flood, transport, communications, energy. So if we're going to have, we need a revolution on, on all of these things. So it's everything from, uh, at one level, from planning perspective, it then comes back to a roundabout, a new driveway off the, you know, how do you get off the main road? What are the regs going to be on that? Through to sewage systems, electricity generation, substations, big issue in, in when you get into the, the links to development. And of course, new railway lines, um, which are the ones that get uh, some fairly massive um, and continue to get fairly massive uh, publicity in spite of the fact we now, if you wanted a shovel ready project, HS2 was the shovel ready project. Does that stop people continually still wanting to cancel it? Uh, no, it doesn't stop them. So all of those things go on. So most of these, and one of the one of the, the things that slows it all up is everything is case by case. That's true after all uh, in a lot of uh, planning for development and certainly true for planning in uh, infrastructure piece. 
So on the one hand, you can have a section 106 that's going to deal with the roundabout that is going to give you access onto this new development and, and these new houses through to the hybrid bill that you have for an HS2 or a Crossrail or indeed a Crossrail 2. And one of the um, one of the, so one of the challenges that you can be pushed back on is that oh well we don't have the time or resource to deal with any of these things. Whether that's parliamentary time and parliamentary lawyers' time, we only have div uh, we only have a planning lawyer here. Uh, you go they, they, you, you start talking to parliamentary lawyers. You've got another another lot of people with um, oh well I don't know how we do that um, on a, on it. So you can get. Section 106 things for bits of infrastructure. You can go to, uh, for example, um, a push to get multiple planning for 5G masts, which do not incidentally cause COVID, just in case anybody on this call was worried about that. Um, so how are you going to do all the different 5G masts in a local authority without having an individual planning application for each one? So there's that's at that uh, end through to running fiber, through to the, the hybrid bill, as I've already said. So how could we address this in a better way? What, what are the kind of tools at our disposal that would allow us to do it better without um, allowing everything to go back through every single level of the court, which would be great for Charlie, because he'd get lots of work. Might be great also for Matthew, because he'd have to produce lots of reports, but it might not be good for the country as a whole. So there are various levels, I think, that we can talk about that and, and various different options that we can pursue. Um, in the planning white paper, it, I think very much about the new way of, or trying to create a new way of thinking about a local plan. So what we try to do is to create a more streamlined way of thinking about local plans with, with simpler areas. I don't want to call them zones because that has a whole lot of baggage behind it, which is uh, not helpful. But we can certainly think about areas for bigger development, areas where the, the middle area where it is much, is much more case by case and then areas where you don't want anything to happen, triple SIs, AONBs, Greenbelt, et cetera. And in each of those, you should have a view on what the infrastructure is that's going to be required. So you should be able to take a view, say in your area for bigger development, at what point are you going to need a new substation or a new drainage, a major sewer, for example, and where there would be much more um, a, sm a smaller scale. So you've got enough electricity supply, each development as it comes forward would be, it would be paying its particular share of, that, um, uh, of those costs. So in those cases then, the burden of the additional substation doesn't fall on just those few houses coming forward right at the end of the, of the capacity pipeline. And that would be true for sewers, flood risk, all sorts of things where you could think about that infrastructure up front. So those broader brush, if you like, local plans is one aspect where we can begin to think about infrastructure better, though of course it still needs to be paid for, something some people try and forget. Uh, and that's where in the white paper, the, the reform of SIL so we get fewer lengthy debates about section 106s, but you get a bigger slice of sill and better ability to allocate that sill to, to the things which you want to allocate it to within a local area, a local authority, or indeed a group of local authorities if it's, if they're, if it's bigger still. So that should enable um, a less fraught debates around the infrastructure which is going to support development. Uh, and equally, incidentally, um, less time being spent on all this minutiae and enabling developers and local authorities more time to debate design codes and get the kind of um, developments that are acceptable and indeed livable by people rather than feeling that they're being sort of having a, a housing estate thrown at them with all a uh, load of consequences that they don't actually like and indeed with which they weren't engaged. But that, that's really more on, on the planning side. So, but on all, all of, I suppose, all of those sorts of planning things are really in the space where it's about, if you like, what we might call consequential infrastructure needed to support particular proposals. So you've got um, 
you've got a, you've got a proposal for a development what are the infrastructure that you need to make that happen of whatever kind how does that fit with the rest of the infrastructure for other people's developments and i think that there's another area so this is the sun a second set of things i guess which isn't really dealt with with in any in any case in the white paper which is the kind of, if you like the feedback loop the feedback loop between the development that you want the infrastructure that you want and the infrastructure that you want and the development. So if I take the example of the uh, arc between Oxford and Cambridge or what in um, National Infrastructure Commission speak we called CAMCOX, Cambridge, Milton Keynes, Oxford. I'm an Oxford girl but I couldn't make it start with Oxford and make it sound right which was really annoying but never mind. So or alternatively we just call it the arc but you know I, I like you know th there's no geography to that so you need to put some geography. Anyway when we were doing that, there obviously, um, and indeed it was a bottom-up proposal that we needed to reopen the passenger traffic between Oxford and Cambridge. Clearly that's not just a few, about a few professors. Um, that needs to be much bigger than that. It was much more about making an effective labour market work where people could live in a good place, work in Oxford, work in Cambridge, work in Milton Keynes, uh, or maybe then change and go in the other direction and their partners could do something as well. So that's what an effective labour market is really about. When we started to do that, you began to think about, well, where does the housing go? So the real constraint on the ability to make this very successful area still more successful and reduce its pinch points were about where you could put settlements. So there's a feedback loop then because the railway can be a success. If you put the development where people are going to get on the railway, buy tickets, ha ha, pay for it, or at least pay its operational costs, and capture maybe uh, value or, or not even um, actual value, but the sort of the tax revenues that are going to be created that wouldn't otherwise be created. All of that story is about getting these things to talk to one another. And that is still something I think we're not doing well enough. Um, MHCLG and the Department for Transport sit on opposite sides of the road, but they're up here. That has to happen at regional and local level as much as it happens at the top level. So getting those two things to talk to one another is, I think, a lot about where these subsequent optionality can take place. It's very windy here for some reason. I hope that those, those whistles, are, are, I don't know quite, I've never had this before. I'm not quite sure what's going on. You'll just have to put up with it. Um, so those things, what we could what could you do you could have a national policy statement and there are people who argue that we should have a national policy statement for the arc out of which you would then get the particular proposals which you would know you could go through a dco process a bit like nuclear power station um, you would then be able to go through your dco and you would have an expectation that you would be in a good place to get permission Alternatively, you could take a non-NPS route to this and say you can still apply separately to be a nationally significant infrastructure project and then have the DCO process around that, which would include potentially your settlement and go through a DCO process and the consultation and all of the rest of it. There's obviously that would be riskier because you wouldn't have the NPS behind you. Um, it's a lengthy process and you're, you're spending all your money up front. And I think we would also have to revisit the way the inspectors are dealing with DCOs in that context, um, because they're becoming increasingly definitive. So then if, you, and if you're talking about a new settlement, that might be 30 years, to, and it'll change. It will evolve. It will need to evolve. And if you had to do the DCO process all over again every time you made a change, that would clearly be a disaster. Alternatively, we can go down the development corporation route, which after all is the basis for Milton Keynes, a new town, effectively a development corporation, successful in the context of um, the, the London Docklands, for example. Again, you've got, so you have an overarching planning, you can put right design codes, you've got an overarching planning authority, you take it out of the remit of the local authority, therefore reducing their risk. Um, you don't have quite the same CPO powers, um, and I'm sure that there'll be some things that we can debate in that area. But the development corporations are really designed for this kind of thing, but not for the infrastructure piece, much more for the place piece. 
So again, we're not quite getting these things to talk to one another. Or you might say, and people in the, in the Q&A might say, well, we need, either we need a new tool, that is revolutionary, and that would slow everything up, actually. I'd much rather fit our, you know, if necessary, tweak our existing tools to do the things that we want them to do than try and invent something new, which will be just, you know, just take forever. And I don't think there's any reason to say that one size fits all options. So it may be just a choice, a question of choosing the right one for the thing that you want. But I'm sure all of this will be contested by my learned colleagues. Well, to one, my mum learned colleague and one, not my learned colleague, but still a very learned colleague in the, in the case of Matthew and his planning expertise. So I'm going to hand over to them at this point for um, a much more, uh, much more informed um, contribution to these debates. Thanks, Bridget. Before I, I, I kick off on mine, I would like to steal my own thunder. One, one phrase that struck me that you said was consequential infrastructure. Let me think where there are two different, at least two different concepts. There's the, there's the stuff that flows from mainly the housing or the employment. And then there's what you might call enabling infrastructure, the stuff mm -hmm. that dictates where the housing should go. And um, I do wonder whether part of the challenges uh, that, that have been recently it is due to the fact that those two forms of infrastructure are dealt with by uh, an operator in different silos. You've, you've got the, the DCO NSIP process for the enabling infrastructure with often different decision makers, whether it's Bayes or Secretary for Transport or whatever, um, operating different paces and in different regimes uh, to, the, to the consequential infrastructure that flows from the housing. And um, I mean, is, is, um, I'm not sure that necessarily matters so long as we've recognized that they're different things. Yeah. Or that they they link in different ways. Should, so, there be, should there be a department for planning and infrastructure that sort of sits atop all of all of this? Yeah, um, I would like to have fewer. I will only only if you got rid of a department at the same yeah. time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's what I had in mind. Like they have in Northern okay. Ireland. We merge the Department for Transport, yeah. which I sometimes call the Department Against Transport. And <laughs> And MHCLG, and we put them together. Well, we had, oh, we've done that. We tried that. DETR, Department of yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that work? Mm, yeah. I was going to say I'm too young for that. But <laughs> I do remember DETR just about, I think I was at university. Was, um, uh, what's his name? Because um, it was created for, uh, oh, I've gone completely blank. F uh, Prescott, John Prescott. Prescott. It was yeah. Deputy Prime Minister, and it was going, to, it was his mega, give him some mega power. Well, um, well, here's calling something that it uh, calling something that pulls some pulls it together just uh, yeah yeah it doesn't necessarily work. Well, food for thought, and do you know? I reiterate my encouragement to people to submit comments and questions because this very much is a sort of idea session. Um, turning to my my piece, and I'm going to look specifically at the NSIP uh, consenting regime under the 2008 Act, and how that might be sharpened up um, to help uh, deliver. The infrastructure revolution or the infrastructure evolution if if we're re renaming it to be uh, more attractive um I, I think as a starting point uh most people involved in infrastructure planning would say that the dco consenting regime under the 2008 act has a, a stronger starting point in terms of efficiency than the conventional planning regime which is the subject of the white paper not least because the whole point of the 2008 act was to streamline the process for consenting nationally significant infrastructure uh, and to a considerable extent it's worked. The statutory deadlines for examination and decision provide focus. They do away with the need for a separate uh, CPO process which has obvious advantages for many schemes and the percentage success rate for applications which are accepted for examination is significantly higher than the relatively depressing uh, a success rate for planning appeals under Section 78 of the 1990 Act. But that doesn't, of course, mean it's a perfect system for all NSIPs. Um, and as we all know, it's an incredibly front-loaded process. And the statistics on success rates and turnaround times look great in, on their own, but they only tell the story from the moment the application is accepted. Uh, and applicants for DCOs, as many, uh, if not all, viewers will appreciate, spend years and literally tens and in some cases hundreds of millions of pounds limbering up to start line before the starting gun is fired. So what can be done to streamline and enhance the process? Well, here are, is a sort of random assortment really of, of ideas uh, based uh, in large part on personal experience. Um, it would be really great to hear any ideas you have too, as well as thoughts on these. So first, it seems to me there's a 
fairly frequent tendency to be over precautionary in relation to pre-application consultation, uh, particularly but not exclusively in relation to public sector-led projects. Uh, part 6 of the 2008 Act only requires one round of consultation, but lengthy iterative pre-app consultation, stage one, stage two, etc., um, has become common practice, at least in relation to projects I've worked on, to the point where it seems to me that it's an expectation now uh, for many, if not most, NSIPs, and to the point where the High Court in the Sefton case, which I did a couple of years ago, Sefton Highways England, uh, held that the outcome of a non-statutory consultation conducted voluntarily by Highways England in relation to the Port of Liverpool A5036 access NSIP was amenable to judicial review. Um, imposing an extra tier of public law regulation before the formal statutory consultation had even started. Um, to some extent, it, of course, it might be said that scheme promoters, oh, they've only got their cells to blame for over-consultation um, and the cost and day that causes, and indeed, in some cases, they may have good commercial reasons for it. But it does seem to me it's become such a phenomenon now that wouldn't it help to have some more guidance from government or the planning inspectorate providing comfort that at least for uh, the more vanilla uh, NSIPs, only a single round, done properly of course, is, is needed in order for there to be adequacy of consultation. Uh, and whilst for the most complex and controversial projects such as Heathrow Third Runway, there's always going to be a, an obvious rationale for the scheme promoters to seek to refine their projects and enhance credibility through the fullest practical consultation, the average ownership is a far cry from that. Uh, and I would add that if anything, Consulting the public on multiple occasions will be counterproductive due to the risk of consultation fatigue. And, and consultation fatigue is a concept well recognised in case law and consultation about principles of when you need to go back and reconsult. So I think some leadership from government or PINs on this uh, would be welcome and it could be easily providing guidance, whether through a formal advice note or in some other format. Secondly, there are the obvious regulatory burdens of environmental impact assessment and where applicable habitats are regulations. We know that uh, the reform of the EIA regime is going to be the subject of public consultation. The last word uh, was from DEFRA where they said in July a consultation will take place shortly. Uh, I think it's doubtful that any changes to the scope of the EIA regime will take NSIPs um, out of it, also out of the need for EIA altogether. Um, the key question to my mind is whether the scope for shaving off any of the burdens of the EIA process without undermining the fundamental purposes of EIA which are to enable public participation in environmental decision making and to provide a clear and accountable mechanism by which decision makers should take environmental information into account. And it seems to me the most obvious place to look is Schedule 4 of the EIA regs, which sets out what's got to go in environmental statements. Uh, I don't think it's inconceivable that the government may propose in the forthcoming consultation to reduce the shopping list of items that have to be covered. Uh, another option may be uh, rather than removing the various heads of things to go in ES, was to say to ES should focus on the main environmental effects or the main environmental outcomes rather than each and every likely significant effect, albeit accepting that would mean some of the less main effects escape scrutiny. A more moderate but possibly a, a blunt instrument, more effective proposal would be to introduce a power to impose word or page limits on environmental statements, producing several shelves full of lever arch files at vast cost and taking months and sometimes years to produce. It isn't likely to assist the purpose of the EIA and may even frustrate them by drowning everybody, the public and decision makers alike, in a forest of paper. I know for Crossrail, albeit that wasn't a DCO case, that the, the ES for Crossrail occupied a whole room in my then chambers. Uh, whereas for, I can't remember which one it was now, but for an equivalent infrastructure project in, in the 80s, shortly after the A directive first came into force, it was a lever arch file. Um, it does seem to me there is overkill. Um, so uh, why not have a power uh, in relation to an anticipated DC application to impose a word or page limit on the ES, having regard to the nature and complexity of the project? That could be done, for example, through the scoping opinion process. Um, I mean, by way of recent analogy, limits that have been encouraged and imposed on skeleton arguments and bundles in planning court hearings, including challenges to DCO decisions, um, have been effective in streamlining planning court proceedings without anyone successfully complaining of unfairness. Why not apply the same process to the, to the uh, procedures that lead to planning court challenges? Thirdly, improving national policy statements. There's an obvious point uh, that has been made and, and, and needs to be uh, remade about incre uh, the increasing age of some of the earlier uh, national policy statements. 
and need to update them to take account of more recent circumstances issues such as net zero, net gain, uh, which will help streamline the subsequent DCO process by focusing debate on those issues rather than people saying they need to be looked at more carefully because they weren't looked at in the original NPS. Um, Robbie Owen, um, a well-known figure, of course, in this world from Pinson Masons, has recently made the suggestion, as others have too, uh, and Bridget reiterated it a moment ago, of regional uh, specific spatial MPSs, such as for MCOX, I can never quite pronounce that, uh, <laughs> providing, a sort of, a, a, if you like, a, setting the framework for large infrastructure, commercial and business development projects, possibly also new settlements. Um, there's obvious consistency between this and the levelling up agenda. Um, I think ensuring NPSs contain the maximum clarity is critical, particularly on the more politically sensitive topics where there's always a lingering temptation to fudge it. Um, and by way of illustration at that point, the recent JR challenges to the airports at NPS endorsing the Heathrow Northwest Runway expansion scheme, which reached the Supreme Court in a couple of weeks' time. In, in those cases, one of the issues in the High Court was distinguishing between those matters which were fixed by the airport's MPS, such as the choice of obviously Heathrow over Gatwick or Heathrow Northwest Runway over the Heathrow Hub alternative extended Northern Runway scheme, they were fixed um, and not for reopening at the DCO stage. And on the other hand, matters which were left open by the MPS and up for argument at the DCO stage, such as surface transport. Um, and in some instances, the distinction between fixed matters and matters left for subsequent debate was obvious. But in other respects, it wasn't. And I, I don't have any inside knowledge, but my strong hunch is deliberately it was left ambiguous. Um, and there was considerable legal argument in the High Court and, and uncertainty. Uh, and absent the challenge to the NPS, if there hadn't been a challenge and the, everyone had gone to the DCO um, stage, uh, that uncertainty would have persisted. Uh, and surely it'd be preferable and possible for NPSs to have greater clarity in what is and isn't fixed. You could, for example, have a summary table, perhaps even as an annex. And the more that can be fixed, the smoother the subsequent process will surely be. Fourth point, for the big, biggest projects, Heathrow, for example, is a hybrid bill uh, process more effective? And again, taking the APS as an illustration, it had to go through Parliament anyway, the NPS, obviously, and be voted on. Uh, and in many ways, this was a project-specific plan. It was adopted in June 2018, after a process that began about over two years prior, in, in 2016, following the Airports Commission in 2015. And next month, October 2020, the JR challenge to the NPS will reach its final destination, the Supreme Court, four years from the process began. And that was with expedition in, in, at every stage of, of the court process. And in the meantime, even before COVID, neither Heathrow Airport Limited nor my clients, the Aurora Group, who promoting the Heathrow West Terminal, seemed likely to submit a DCO application until 2021. Now, realistically, even that pre-COVID timescale would have best have seen DCO decisions in quarter one 2022, four years after the AMPS uh, uh, was adopted uh, and six years after the AMPS if process was kicked off. And then there would have been up to two years of further JRs, probably all the way to the Supreme Court again, quite possibly taking till 2024, based upon timescales of the AMPS, JR and HS2 before it. Wouldn't it have been quicker to do the whole thing in one go via a parliamentary process? Um, fifthly and finally, um, even if some or all of the refinements to the DCO process I've mentioned were to be made, uh, would the DCO process for all national infrastructure projects be better than the new streamlined uh, conventional planning pro process in which development annotated in a growth area by a local plan, the examination of which is to be limited, limited to a maximum of nine months, gets automatic outline planning permission. It seems to me that uh, if the new conventional planning regime envisaged by the white paper happens, um, which personally, uh, rare amongst planning barristers, I hope it does, um, then um, the advantages of the DCO process over the conventional planning process will, at least for some projects, narrow. Uh, and for some, it may be quicker and cheaper to secure annotation as a growth area and consequent outline permission. And take, for example, new settlements, which Matt's going to talk about in a moment. Paragraph 2.32 of the white paper, for those who have the, the, the black and white version with paragraph numbers rather than the sexy version with pictures and no paragraph numbers. Um, paragraph 2.32 very sensibly envisages uh, that new settlements could have the option of being promoted as DCO. But for those which are in single or concentrated ownerships, um, such as those on former airfields, such as Dunsfold, why not go down the growth area route? 
Uh, but those which require land assembly, for example, um, say the North Essex type uh, example, uh, there uh, the, the DCO process clearly still offers the advantage of dealing with planning consent and CPO, etc. in one fell swoop. And to me, what this tells us is that one size doesn't fit all um, and that there should be a choice between the two procedures, which I think is how I read the white paper. It won't, if, if they do become NSIPs, they won't be mandatory. And if that's the case for large residential developments, why might it not also be the case for other forms of NSIP? What would be wrong with reformulating sections 23 and 35 of the 2008 Act so that all nationally significant infrastructure projects may, but don't have to go down the DCO route? And surely those promoting a project are li likely to be best placed to know what is the, the best, most streamlined means of progressing their project through the planning regime. Why not leave it to them to decide? And, and I think monitoring and the decisions taken by, by applicants and the reasons for them would be a valuable tool in identifying potential further improvements to regimes in, in future years. Um, I say this also by way of final comment, that giving applicants the choice about which procedure to use will also cut through the pretty unhelpful debates that can be had as to whether a project is required to go down one route or the other, the 2008 Act route or the 1990 Act route. And to give two recent examples of that, um, such a debate led to a JR in relation to the current proposals for expansion of Stansted Airport, in which I was acting for the government. Stop Stansted expansion contended that the Secretary of State for Transport was wrong not to identify the project as a mandatory NSIP or, or alternative that he erred in law in not making a Section 35 direction. That JR has been rumbling on now for over a year and a half. Uh, an application to appeal the, the dismissal of it still before the Court of Appeal. And in the meantime, a change of local politics led the local authority to change its mind on whether to grant permission. Uh, and they, having decided to grant it, they then re re revoked that resolution and decided to refuse it. So the whole thing's just been a bit of a mess. Um, and in relation to the Aurora Group proposals for Heathrow Rest, just, just before the COVID um, uh, issues uh, reached their, their worst. PINs uh, refused to grant Section 53 authorization for land access to undertake surveys as they remained unconvinced that the project formed part of an NSIP and therefore qualified for 2008 Act powers. And it seems to me in each case, th this issue about was it or wasn't it within the one act or the other was an unhelpful debate, which could have been avoided altogether if the market had a choice about which procedure to use. So there are a few ideas. There's other obvious ideas. I mean, everybody, everybody, I think, agrees that the process for amending applications, for example, should be streamlined. So I've sort of skipped that. Um, but there's uh, one, the big, the big issue raised in the white paper is about um, housing. And uh, Matt, you're going to uh, discuss that now. Yeah. What, uh, and perhaps, perhaps before you we go yeah. into the housing thing. Yeah, I've, I've got some questions. It sounds like Bridget does too. We should just reflect on whether actually any aviation example has any relevance to anything else ever again. <laughs> because, well, I mean, I mean, if I have a system which is going to work for, for aviation, I mean, you know, I think that is sledgehammers and nuts because oh. one of the reasons I supported and indeed worked on the idea for an, 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 an um, estuary airport is precisely because I think the aviation stuff on land is so contested, so mm. horrendously contested that we will never ever get anywhere with it. So I'm really interested in the new settlements thing, but I, I'm not sure that I want to take any aviation examples as telling me anything about anything. What about railways though? I mean, a, I mean HS2 is probably of, of a similar cattle of fish to, to Heathrow expansion. We've got at least one major railway infrastructure proposal, the sort of what, the HS3 east to west. Uh, HS3 is not, a t it's not a term of art anybody's recognising. Northern Powerhouse Rail, Charlie. Northern Powerhouse Rail, sorry, I stand corrected. Because yeah, cool. it's not necessarily high, well, it, higher speed, yeah, but yes. high speed. Yeah. Um, um, so, but, but yeah, no, I, don't, I think roads might be mm, similar, yeah. actually, because people don't like roads. People mm. don't like uh, um, airports, but mm. they're very different in that they've got that linear thing to yeah. them. Yeah. Um, but and people on the whole, the, the idea for East West Rail came from the local communities. They wanted it. Mm. Mm. Then Powerhouse Rail has local uh, support and so on. So mm. it's de definitely different in that you've got this long line. Mm. Uh, and there are people who don't want anything ever anywhere. Um, but you know that's true for for everything everywhere forever. Yes, I, I, I was thinking about the long line thing yesterday. Actually, whether whether that made 
you know, comparing HS2 and Heathrow in my mind, and which, which, was, which was more difficult to get through, one very big impact concentrated in one place or, or something spread out. Well, we've got space in the ground for HS2 and no space in yeah. the ground for, uh, for Heathrow. So yeah. It's, yeah. That's the answer. Yes, I think that probably is the answer. Yes. <laughs> Matt, you had a question or comment. Yeah, well, I, I, I think we've got, well, two, possibly three questions, actually. Um, and I, I sort of find the, the, the point made about Camcot's interesting in terms of whether an NPS would be useful. Um, I sort of quite like the idea of um, some sort of combined you know, policy for the area and w whether that should be sort of more locally led rather than sort of being dictated from, from government. It feels like a sort of, you've got very active local authorities that have got the ability to actually think about how that rail connection works and also, you know, the capacity of those areas to support additional housing. And, you know, I'm, I'm slightly biased because I think the DCO process is awesome, but it's got, you know, the potential to sort of be a combined project where you've linked um, homes and infrastructure together and that being informed by a really strong local policy would feel like a really good solution to quite a complicated problem so um, I sort of and they are putting together a non-statutory spatial strategy yeah, for yeah exactly. and, and, and I think that, that that could work really really well and I think it's interesting and I'll sort of come on to it shortly just in terms of the sort of the, the, the common criticism, which is unfair of TCOs being sort of, you know, having a democrat democratic deficit, um, and I think actually there's there's real opportunity where there is such local support for for projects to actually be taken through the DCO process in a much more consensus based mm. um, way, um, and that sort of feels like quite a nice way to deliver cam costs. I wonder, do you think Matt? I mean, how that would then what the vehicle for that would be? I mean. Um, Whenever something's non-strategy, a lawyer sort of, you know, internally rolls their eyes because you know you can then you know you can still argue the toss over it. Um, and um, I mean, one way of doing it, the, the white paper is quite quite quiet, if I recall correctly, on joint plans and joint joint plan in, in the post white paper. It was, um, yes, it is. It was quite quiet, and that was because we wanted to encourage them but not enforce them. Hmm. Hmm. And it'll be interesting to see when, what, when the legislation starts to become more yeah, uh, exactly. co we, we took a decision quite early on to, mm. to stick with lo local planning authorities as local planning authorities, mm. rather mm. than try and redefine LPAs to be some other set of entities on the grounds that that would just end up with massive rows. Mm. So we wanted to encourage people, you know, unitaries to work with their counties and so on, but to do that in a much more, you know, not a legislative way. I mean, if we're sort of, if you like, sort of tearing up the textbook and thinking, you know, creatively, another way of doing it would be to, to innate for regional and national policy statements for them to be promoted by a consortium of, of the relevant local authorities. And they would take effect as national policy statements for their area, but they would have been effectively community led. Yeah. Uh, local authority yeah. led, which would then enable a DCO process to follow afterwards with all the advantages of that, but with that um, stamp of local approval beforehand because they'd, they'd so be being... That, that, re would, that would require what in the way of... It would need the planning act to be amended. It would uh, need the planning well, act. I, I, I suppose would it, would it though, because I, I suppose the starting point is that if, if Campox as a, as a project is a is the combination of a you know a, a, a rail a rail line and and some housing? Um, you've got the national networks MPS, which which says that you can have a, a linear um, route between A and B, um, and you need to demonstrate why it needs to go in that particular area. If you then got the local authorities saying that you know this is the amount of housing we think is you know needed in our particular areas. There's not necessarily a, a, a gap in terms of what you'd need from a sort of planning perspective to set out the sort of usual planning case. And so, you know, you, you could potentially sort of go without some of those, 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 those points, providing you've got some joined up local support. I think there's different, there's different ways of doing it. I mean, I think, to my mind, the, the, the key message from this discussion, and indeed from knowing, knowing what you're going to say too, Matt. In the we'll let Matt say it, actually, instead of keeping on talking ourselves. <laughs> but the key message is, is let's not have 
um, you know, four stops. You have to go down this way. You have to go down this way. One size doesn't. Let's let's have all these options. You know, if they if they're all potentially good for some projects, why force things in down one route or the other? It may be a an MPS promoted by local authorities would be a great idea in one place. It may be a non-statutory joint plan would work somewhere else. It may be that a a post white paper conventional planning approach would work somewhere else. Hey, we've got Robbie on uh, coming in. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, here we are. Matt, so <laughs> we better let Matt. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, I'll start looking through the questions and, and Robbie's comments. Well, they yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> we have to pay attention to Robbie, don't we? <laughs> I suppose the, the other point to note is, is, is that there, there was a question on sort of proportional EIA and you know, yeah. the, the, the yeah. there is sort of the, the link to the white paper is the, the role of digital EIA in, in terms of actually helping yeah. streamline that process. Because I really like your idea, Charlie, in terms of having limits on environmental statements, but actually looking forward, there's a real role for um, digital mm. EIA to help streamline that process and that makes it much more user friendly. I don't think most of the lawyers on, on this would particularly like the idea of not having a sort of, you know, a five volume ES to, to, to trawl through, but having a sort of digital interactive um, <laughs> way of, yeah, exactly, yeah. You must be very um, strong to pick up a box full. That's, okay. small, that's a small uh, box. <laughs> 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 no, I couldn't agree more. I and mean, that's obviously at a piece with what the white paper is talking about in terms of digital plan making. Um, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more on that. That may well stream, but it's got to be done in a way that's effective and that doesn't create more red tape, just digital red tape. Absolutely. You're using digital as a reason why it doesn't matter how heavy it is. That's not good planning. Yeah, completely agree. Right, Matt, we ought to let you do your bit. Yeah, go <laughs> on. Yes. We? It would be kind, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to touch on um, the, the, the opportunity of um, large-scale housing to be uh, included in the NSIP regime and picking up on sort of Bridget's point that it's, housing isn't really infrastructure. I think the sort of the, 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 the main point I'm very keen on is that we've essentially got an NSIP regime that's been working effectively for the last 10 years, and it's shown itself to be a very effective way of delivering complex and controversial projects. And you know, with that learning that's gone into the last 10 years, we've got a real opportunity to use that to help unblock um, barriers to delivering some of the, the more problematic sort of larger scale settlements. And that feels like a really important opportunity that's, that's recognized in the white paper. And so just to sort of go back a couple of steps and, you know, from my perspective, I think the case for major housing projects being included in the NSIP regime is, is principally similar to the, the case for creating the regime in the first place. Essentially, there's a, a national need for this type of development and the existing consenting route is often too slow and too uncertain. So... The Planning Act regime was introduced in 2008 and it was very much a sort of revolutionary step. And so it sort of helped streamline the decision making process for major infrastructure projects, trying to make it fairer, faster uh, for communities and applicants alike. And it recognised that that new consenting process was necessary um, for the most um, important developments in the country. So the, the regime's been designed to learn lessons from Heathrow and taking Bridget's point that we shouldn't really um, take too much on, 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 on any aviation project. But the, the, the process is being designed to cover a wide range of um, projects. And it's been expanded um, recently in uh, 2015 and 2017 to cover both business and commercial projects uh, and also an element of housing. And so um, related um, uh, housing up to 500 units. And so these projects are consented through the DCO process. They're considered by the planning inspectorate with the relevant Secretary of State ultimately making the decision. As I say, the, the regime has been very successful in accelerating planning decisions and making um, and giving greater certainty to project promoters. I think Charlie's mentioned that um, it's an exacting process uh, that suits projects where a need has been demonstrated and the proposals need to meet exemplary standards for design and mitigation. The point um, 
that, that comes through quite clearly there is that hard work can reap high rewards. And so the NSIP regime is currently achieving a success rate of 94% of all DCO applications having been consented, um, which is a real sign um, of the hard work that promoters have been putting in there. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging process to get through. So the, um, the regime is available to most of the nation's important and significant projects, but only housing is currently excluded, yet it's got the greatest national need. And so the white paper reforms provide a framework within which some of the historic concerns about the use of DCOs for large scale housing can be addressed. And so the new style local plans can identify locally derived circumstances where the use of DCO powers would be appropriate for substantial development whilst regulating how those DCO powers are used. The structured process of consultation and engagement required for DCOs would also allow for proper and full engagement with communities throughout the process, not just at the point of allocation. As Charlie's highlighted, the process can sometimes take time, but the promoter is, control of, in, is in control of that. Um, we've got examples where um, Highways England or National Grid have moved from a standing start to a submission in less than 12 months while still being able to undertake um, appropriate and meaningful engagement. So DCOs can generate confidence in delivery, reduce the burden on the public sector, capture land value, uplift and coordinate all of the necessary consents and powers. The private sector would also have the opportunity to use this delivery tool within the framework created by the, the white paper. I think a, a really important point is that this change could be implemented much more quickly um, than some of the other wider, more substantial planning reforms contained within the white paper. It would be a quick and easy change to the Planning Act. Um, and so doing that in months rather than years could provide a really important early win for government um, and, and help unlock some, some really important housing sites. I think just to sort of touch on some of the reasons why uh, the regime hasn't been considered appropriate for, for, for housing development and sort of how, how we think those points um, um, relate um, in current circumstances. I think the first point which we sort of touched on relates to the uncertainty about the national policy regime. And so does there need to be a national uh, spatial span, it's national spatial strategy? Um, the second point relating to concerns about uh, democratic accountability. And then the last point being um, whether DCOs are expensive and inflexible tools to deliver this type of um, project. And I think the first two concerns raised, um, I think are essentially addressed through the white paper itself. And so the first point um, is that the white paper proposes to, to determine and direct the scale and broad location for new housing development and requires local plans to identify sites for growth and substantial development. And so from my perspective, that, that certainly suggests that you don't need a spatial strategy or an NPS. The second point in terms of um, uh, local accountability, the local plan process itself is going to be developed through an enhanced approach to public engagement to settle the spatial strategy for each local area. And then when you look at the DCO process itself um, and any sort of DCO examination, it's very clear that members of the public have got a really good opportunity to get involved and actively in engage in the process. And you can look at anything from Thames Tideway through to um, many of the, the, the other projects have gone through the system. And so it seems that a DCO process combined with the new streamlined local plan process is at least as, as much um, um, accessible as, as the existing process, if not more, more um, accessible. I think the point about flexibility is an important one to touch on. And, you know, the planning and EIA rules applying to DCOs are much the same as, as those that apply to normal planning. And so using a, a housing project in that system could, could, could use the very same Rochdale envelope parameters and design principles that are applied on day-to-day -day planning applications. And in fact, when you look at some of the uh, DCO projects that use parameter-based uh, approaches that's been informed by the TCA process and so taking some of that learning back in would be um, um, uh, very straightforward. 
you might require some changes to the DCO process and um, to allowing housing um, projects to come through. But the types of changes that you would need would also benefit other NSIP projects. And so they, they, it would be a good opportunity to, to get those changes in. I think the, the opportunity though um, that, that, that I'm keen to sort of um, explore is whether the NSIP regime could also have a, a wider application for, for, for larger scale housing development. And so there's a number of reasons why um, there may be circumstances why you don't have a, a, an up-to-date local plan, even with the new system um, uh, where you're not uh, sufficiently addressing uh, local housing need or where sites become available between local plan cycles. I think you know, we're all aware that the national objective of having countrywide local plan coverage with up-to-date plans um, that in total fully meet has, uh, national housing requirements has long been an aspiration and the white paper sets out some very important proposals to help with that delivery. But never, nevertheless, there's going to be additional circumstances where the government or local authorities may find it very useful to have DCO powers available to promoters and that could cover you know, instances such as um, a situation where uh, the local plan reviews, um, uh, the situation between local plan reviews where the local planning authorities support large scale housing, recognises the benefit of promoters having DCO delivery powers, where local plans have not yet been adopted or produced, or um, importantly sites that have got complex cross-boundary or infrastructure related issues, um, particularly in the absence of any duty to cooperate, whether the DCO process could help unlock those particular sites. So that feels like some very sort of important situations that could add to some of the circumstances that are ref referred to in the, the white paper. And so we've been looking at um, some options about how you would go about capturing large scale housing projects in the NSIP regime. And we've sort of identified two possible approaches. The first is where you enable uh, developers to uh, choose whether to promote a DCO application and very much in line with what you were saying before, Charlie. Um, and so for instance, if you've got a, a scheme that's over 5,000 homes or you've got a particular barrier to um, development that you would then pass that threshold test the alternative would be where, similar to the business and commercial projects, you would ask the Secretary of State for permission, essentially, to use the DCO process. And that gives a, an opportunity for the Secretary of State to prevent the use of DCO um, powers in situations where they may not be warranted. And so you can see that both of those approaches would be highly worthwhile and could really help uh, enable delivery of nationally important levels of housing development which would not otherwise come forward um, and so obviously strongly support what the government's seeking to do but we think it could go a little bit further in terms of helping deliver some of those important projects slightly earlier and certainly from a sort of practitioner's perspective DCOs clearly provide a really powerful tool for the development and delivery um, um, of, of projects in the framework created by the white paper now means that a lot of those reasons that were originally used to discount housing um, from the NSIP pr uh, process have, have been taken away. And as I said before, the, the, the regime could be amended relatively quickly um, to allow uh, some really important and quick wins. And so um, I think it would be a really fantastic idea to have housing um, in certain circumstances in, in the NSIP regime, but very keen to hear both of your thoughts on that. Thanks, Matt. Um, just to let people know, some of you have already voted already. I, I, we put a poll up there. Should new settlements and other major housing schemes be able to promote as NSIPs under the 2008 Act? Um, about 40% of you have, have answered that already. I'll give you another few seconds to those who haven't answered. If you can get that poll up, do do please put your answers in. It'll be interesting to see what the, the outcome is. And my immediate thought is, is how would um, uh, the housing promoted through under the 2008 Act as a DCO, uh, how would that interplay with the identification of housing need 
for each individual? Would it be extra? So effectively, each local authority would have to plan in their local plan for a certain amount of need. And then the, uh, what the 2008 Act um, DCO housing provision would be, would be sort of extra icing on the cake. Or, or, or would there be some way that local plans would effectively under provide because in anticipation that the remainder would be put forward through a DCO? I think the starting point is that the you know the, the potential number of projects that this might relate to is is going to be relatively small, and so it's not sort of a DCO for every local authority, and so it's going to be the exception rather than the rule. And um, I think certainly from my perspective, um, you know, if government's in a situation where they're setting the housing numbers, the local authority is then identifying the sites, the the the, the the working assumption would be that the local authority would it would identify a site that, that that would be delivered through the DCO process, and that would be because it met certain circumstances. I think the the sort of the additional sort of suggestion I talked about is that you know noting that we've always you know had the aspiration to to have local plans that are you know that targeted you know full housing housing needs. And provision and we've never never got there before so if if that situation were to arise again it might be quite helpful for us to to have a dco option to deliver projects where there is no up-to-date local plan or there is a um a problem with 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 um um the identify uh, identification of um of housing sites and so using it as a as a backup plan and so I think those two options um, would give you sort of sufficient certainty that, you know, you're delivering the housing numbers that government have set. And it's not sort of, it's not the additional icing on the cake. It's to, it's to, it's to meet the, 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 the identified housing, housing need. I think that must be right, that this isn't sort of about icing. This is about a mechanism for delivery rather yeah. than, um, than, than something being put on top. But I mean, I think that the, <clears throat> it's more that the point about the um, simpler local plan process is it deliver it identifies broader areas mm. within which people can come forward with whatever it is that they want mm. with a stronger expectation of whether it's going to get outlined or not if it needs land assembly and if it needs some kind of cpo process then the dco route might well be a way forward for that if it doesn't, but you've still got a big area and, and Robbie's come and uh, asked about LDOs, then an LDO, uh, an LDO um, designation mm. might actually be just as suitable. So the big difference, I think, is whether you need to have some CPO powers. Mm. And I think the other big difference is whether you, there is actually more of an infrastructure element, if you like, something mm. underlying, some network piece that you're trying to also to produce. The reason mm. that I think housing was... Um, not part of, of the of the infrastructure commission is partly be obviously it's it's such a sensitive set of things, but partly also that infrastructure is is the enabling bit. Um, mm. is, is it enabling? It's enabling the ability for you to have the housing. So if you put the housing in there as well, it sort of rather negates your purpose. Of course, if you're going to think about the infrastructure, you have to think about who the people are who are going to be there to use it. And then that immediately takes you back into where you actually might want that housing to happen. So there is a lot of circularity there. Yeah, well, that's sort of my point about not operating in silos and finding a way yeah. to sort of gel okay. this together. So I, I think my enabling infrastructure was much more about where there's a feedback between. Right? I've come forward, I want to put this development here. It needs some infrastructure. We should think about that, not just for your bit, but across the bigger piece. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of consequential compared to where you've got a feedback loop between enabling and then what would happen, but then it feeds back. Yes, yeah. Sure that there's there's a link there. I'm, um, I'm interested in your point about, but I'd really like to discuss this NPS versus hybrid bill. Yes. Um, so, so again, Robbie's put up something that says, well, you know, does the government have the capacity to do an NPS? Yes. The government has a capacity to do a hybrid bill. They are hugely unpopular mm. with the parliamentary draftsmen and with the people who have to have their or get their arm twisted well up their back to sit on the select committee that has to look at it oh, they get a knighthood or a damehood at the end don't they so. <laughs> yeah. 
rest of the, the, the cannon fodder has to sit there. And indeed, that is the kind of bribery and corruption which has to go on in order to um, get people persuade somebody to actually take one of these on. So I'm, I'm not sure whether in parliamentary terms an NPS is any easier or more difficult than a hybrid bill. I mean, one thing I hope is uh, if there's going to be some tinkering with the 2008 Act in order to create a power for new settlements to go through the DCA process, that does provide an opportunity to refine other bits of the 2008 Act as well. Um, uh, and so part of, um, the, uh, part of the answer may be streamlining or improving the process for NPSs to be adopted. Because I mean, going back to the idea of, um, of having a sort of regional specific one for MCOX, it, it, it would, I'm attracted to it, but the danger is it adds another layer of, of process and burden. Yeah. And so it's got to be advantageous. Um, so I think Bobby's question, I, I'm going to duck the LDO uh, question simply because my answer would have to refer to something that's still live uh, to do with North <laughs> Um, the answer is yes, but I won't give my reasons. No, well, I think I, 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 I think that, um, yeah. um, I think agree the LDOs could be another route where you don't need any CPO powers. Yeah, um, yeah and I think the real sort of. The, the, I, I just don't believe I mean, everything we've always been told is that you cannot have more than one hybrid bill in Parliament at a time because there's no capacity to deal with it, they can't manage it. Uh, and so when we were arguing that you should put Crossrail 2 through at the same time as HS2 Phase 2, oh no, we can't possibly do that, we couldn't manage all the stuff and all the, um, all, all the um, uh, you know, select committee stuff and um, people's representations and so on. That always struck me as being a bit pathetic, but nonetheless it is what they say. Mm. Whereas if you could have an NPS which would cover more than one thing, I guess maybe that could be more effective. And interesting, Robbie's comment. I, mean, I agree with what Robbie said. Hybrid bills are devastating. Effect they are. I mean, plainly you couldn't have hybrid bills for everything. There isn't the time, there isn't the willingness. But for the really big ticket stuff, such as you know, Heath, would it would Heathrow have been consented by now? I, 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 quite possibly. Um, I mean, the other thing, of course, with um, with hybrid bills, I think after the HS2 Supreme Court case there's probably now pretty much no scope for challenge because anything that could be thrown at hybrid bill, namely European law, well, that's going out the window anyway, but uh, EIA, SEA, that, they, they challenged that, the challenge failed in the Supreme Court. So I think now a, uh, a high, the outcome of a hybrid bill process would be pretty much insulated from challenge. Whereas, of course, with the 2008, you've got two bites, you've got to challenge the NPS and then challenge to the DCO at the end of it. We're, we're nearing the end of time, just to, uh, you, I think you will have seen um, on your screens the results of the first poll, 89% in favour of Matt's proposal, so that's a clear, uh, clear winner. And with uh, a third, well, I'm going to end the polling now as we're coming up to the end for the remaining one, last call, and the results are to, would clearer, consulta clearer guidance on consultation requirement be beneficial? 96% yes. These are these poll results, a bit like Saddam Hussein or the Belarusian, Belarusian elections, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a, a closer call. Um, now, question two, should the choice between what process we use left um, to the applicants decide? Interesting. Um, yes, 46%, no, 54%. So, so um less uh less decisive answer there which is interesting well, that begs the question of who should be allowed to make the decision of what yeah. process to use yeah. is it, does. Are you to allow the the pins to make or a secretary does you have to go to the secretary of state to uh, the department will decide what you're allowed to do i'm really disappointed in that um response yeah. of people uh, last... more flexibility is a good thing Yes, I, I, I agree, but, but <laughs> there we are. It's always good to get some unpredictable answers. Um, fine, final point, I think I'll leave the last word with, with Angus. I, I always say first, I think we all know who everybody is because I'm told that the GPDR police could come knocking on my door if I read out the names of, of the full names of people. But Angus has said, uh, I think Angus is still here, uh, about ES point, having something at the same at the start of an ES of what the residual significant impacts are predicted to be post mitigation. <laughs> A bit like traffic light lab food labelling might incentivize applicants to minimize them and lead to more efficient examination. Um, 
I think that's probably right. I, I'm, I'm probably not the first person to speak because I had a chocolate bar just before we started, despite the big red label about how much uh, rubbish it had inside. But I think that's a good idea because it provides a degree of focus to an ES to have that have a requirement like that at the beginning. It's sort of what I was get grasping at when I talk about sort of main environmental outcomes. I like the word outcomes better than impacts or effects, actually. Mm. That's, uh, again, a nudge towards providing greater focus and greater direction. So something like that, absolutely, I, I support that. Um, I think also that it allows you to rank them. Yes, but yeah. I, I wanted, when yeah. we were doing the review of, of inquiries, I wanted us, instead of having a statement of common ground, which again, mm. can produce loads of verbiage, which tells you nothing, I wanted a statement of uncommon ground. So in other words, a statement of disagreement yes. which is part of the DCO process. Yeah. But again, you have to, it really, you then have to focus down on what the really important things are instead yeah. of all the sort of, you know, whatever it is, you uh, endless pages about bats and newts. These are the issues that have right. to be decided. Bats and newts are my best friends, admittedly. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Absolutely, and that, that statement of disagreed, uh, you know, statement of, of unagreed ground um, is, um, is very useful because it, it tells everybody what we need to debate about. But no, I agree with that. What I wouldn't like to see is that being diluted into these awful plus, plus, minus, minus color coded charts you get, particularly in the sustainability appraisal, which uh, are quite an industry. And personally speaking, uh, uh, sorry to anybody listening who's involved in that sort of process, I don't think are very helpful. Um, yeah. and, uh, so, well, I think, yeah, so, so we, we're, maybe what we need to do is decide which bits of the industry which support all these massive amounts of work that we all do, which bits do we want to get rid of? And mm. how are we going to help the poor people who will no longer be able to do all those things? How, we'll, we'll need a fund for the reinstatement <laughs> of unemployed consultants. <laughs> <How about that? laughs> the Rosewell Fund. <laughs> 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 well, on that note, uh, we better, it's Friday afternoon, we, we better um, sign off and leave you to, to clear your desk for the weekend. We hope you have a great weekend. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for signing in um, and, and for everybody who's commented to the, to the uh, discussion either in the chat or in the Q&A and indeed for filling in the polls. Um, and uh, with that, I will wish you a, a good weekend and I hope so, at least some of you I'll get the chance to see in person soon once this dreadful disease has passed us. Cheerio. I hope so. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.